So turn to Mark chapter 15 in the New Testament and look down for verse 33, the sixth hour. This is the word of God. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. It hurt him of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, sure, this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Where were the men? It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he, had le when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Jesus. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was left. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of them into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to him because they were afraid. So reads God's holy and infallible word. There's a saying that is this, courage is not having no fear, it's acting despite your fears. The women at the tomb, and before that in our reading, the women at the cross, they display fear, but Sandwiched between them, there's a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who acts in great boldness. What's the difference? How is it he's so different? Is it because he's a man? No. How does he overcome his fear? How does he display boldness? The simple answer is faith. Faith. 
faith enables one to overcome their fears. Faith enables one to be courageous. It doesn't take away fear, but it enables one to act despite their fears. Joseph, we read, is waiting for the kingdom of heaven, waiting for God's kingdom. And he acts in what he does. He acts through faith. Now, here, this is an exceptional time, for obvious reasons, in history, the whole of history. But I want not so much thinking of Christ at this point when I say exceptional time. Think of believers. Think of the church. It's an exceptional time for the church because this is the beginning. We haven't yet had the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit hasn't yet been poured out in power. There isn't clarity in the hearts and the understandings of even Peter, James and John and so on. And so the women who are at the cross and then later on go to the tomb, the women are women of faith. They have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't yet have the fullness of understanding. They don't yet fully understand that Jesus had to go to the cross. They don't yet fully understand that he's going to rise from the dead. They don't fully understand what Jesus was doing on the cross. They don't fully understand these things. And so as a consequence, although they are ladies of faith, they act purely out of fear. So this enables me to be able to say to you this morning that knowledge alone, knowledge of the truth alone, we need knowledge. We need to understand the gospel. But knowledge of the truth alone will keep you distant. Keep you distant from the Lord. It's only by faith that we come close to Jesus Christ. Knowledge alone will keep you distant. Just an outsider, outsider observing on. By faith, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Let's consider, first of all, from the cross. From the cross. And we have in verse 40, the women at the cross. Some women were watching from a distance. They're watching. That's a good thing to be watching. Watch. To watch is a very biblical word. The Lord Jesus Christ had told his disciples at Gethsemane that they were to watch and pray. And could you keep, not keep watch with me for one hour, Peter, and the others? And, and that watching, when we looked at it, we saw that it's, it's not just being on the lookout. There might be some uh, people coming to attack us. It's not that kind of watching. It's a spiritual watching. It's a watching over your heart. It's a watching for the times. It's a watching to live with your eyes on Christ. That's the watching that Jesus speaks about. But that's a different word. That's a different Greek word that is used in Mark 14 to the one that's used here. Some women will watch. You look at the next words that go with it. They were watching from a distance. They were merely observing. It's a word here, watching, this word we read in verse 40. It's used seven times in Mark. And every time that it's used, it's used of people who are observing. Some of them may be up close, but they're just observing. They're not being touched by these things. It's not affecting them. They're just watching. They're observing. And so these women, they're watching from a distance. It's not from faith. Like Joseph of Arimathea. Or leading to faith. Like the centurion. Surely, this man is a son of God. He sees, he watches what happens, and that leads to faith, that leads to this glorious exclamation. By faith, by faith we sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. By faith we sing that. But here, the women, though they're at the cross, 
far from it. They're far from Christ at this point. Theirs is a heart of fear. Theirs is a heart of doubt. Theirs is a heart of uncertainty. Is that you this morning? Doubt and uncertainty as to the truth of God's will. Where is your heart this morning? A heart. I say this morning. I'm not talking about tomorrow. It might be different and it'll be different the next day. No, no. It's either that your heart is a heart of faith or it's a heart of doubt. Unbelief. No alternative. There is Joseph from the cross, we might say, from the cross to the grave or, or to the tomb. Now this Joseph, it tells us, he's a member, a prominent member in verse 43 of the council. In other words, he's one of the Sanhedrin. One of those, you remember those who were here with us last week, whom um, Nicodemus, another member of the Sanhedrin, said to Jesus, he came to him at night and he said, we know that you are sent from God. We know something of who you are. And we were looking at who are those whom Nicodemus is speaking about? Who are the we know? Well, here's one. Joseph of Arimathea. He is, he is one of those who knew that Jesus was something special. He knew that. And what is more, you read here of him that he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Just like that man at Jesus' birth. Remember him? Simeon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he took hold of the baby Jesus and he said, Ah, oh, my eyes at last have seen, my arms even have held your salvation. Now I can depart in peace because I know everlasting life is this. Joseph of Arimathea, it's the same one, waiting for these things, waiting for the kingdom of God. And by faith, some, as to the fullness of what Joseph of Arimathea uh, knows and understands, we, we're not told, we don't need to know. But by faith, somehow he knows, he believes it's through Christ. By faith, does, it, does he actually see more? When in verse 46 you read that he wraps uh, the body of Jesus and places it in a tomb and rolls a stone against the entrance of the tomb, but doesn't anoint the body. It was common to do that. But he doesn't do that. Why doesn't he do that? Was it that he saw more by faith and believed that such a thing wasn't needed? Because Jesus was going to rise. We're not told. But he certainly, some of boldness tells us. He went boldly, look, it's there in verse 43. He went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now think about this. That must have taken great courage because Jesus was an accursed. Cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. And that's effectively what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was cursed by the people, the Jewish people, the ruling body, the religious leaders and so forth. He was cursed by them. And here's one of their number who should sure the better coming and wanting to take this body and then to lay it in a purpose built tomb when really he's fit for nothing else than to be cast into a Gehenna, a place for just chucking the dead, as it were, worthless, being nailed to a cross. Yet by faith, Joseph of Arimathea comes with boldness. Boldness to ask Pilate for the body. There's Joseph, oh, acting through faith. There's the women, and they're watching on from a distance. They have a faith in Christ, but it's, as I say, it's confused at this point. They don't yet fully understand things. And there they are. That, that faith is not strong enough, therefore, to be able to enable them to be bold and be by his side or anything like that. And so they shrink in fear, like Peter. You surely were one of them. You were with him. But he denied it, didn't he? Calling down curses, even using God's name as a, taking it in vain, using it effectively as a swear word. But not Joseph. Joseph is bold. Faith in action. Both Joseph and, we read off the centurion, both are our leaders. 
One represents the Jewish people as part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jews, as it were. And the other, a centurion, is a leading Gentile because he's in charge of many soldiers, isn't he? And one acts through faith, Joseph, the Jew. The confession of faith made by the centurion, the Gentile, tells us that here's a Jew, here's a Gentile, both have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it reminds us that Jesus brings all Jew and Gentile into his kingdom. Does that include you? Do you belong to Jesus this morning? Whether you were born, raised as a Jew, whether you were born and never really understood or heard the term Gentile, we don't use that, do we? But a non-Jew of them. All can come. All must come. Do you belong to Jesus? From the cross, secondly, to the tomb. To the tomb. You come back, you, we started off with the, the women at the cross. Then, as I say, sandwiched in between, there's Joseph going and displaying his great boldness. Not time to take up the various things that he says, and all of it now is just a, a glimpse into these things. But then we return back, you might say the bottom part of the sandwich, the bottom slice of bread, or the top slice of bread, the sandwich. We come back to the women. And what you find is uh, when he's rolling a stone against the entrance of the tomb, in verse uh, 47, they're observing again. They see where he's laid. And then in chapter 16 and verse 1, there they are. And they bring spices that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. But of course, that's not necessary, is it? It's not necessary because it, in one sense it's been done already because a lady, indeed Mary, had anointed his body. She, she maybe did or didn't know what she was doing, really, but Jesus said, she has prepared my body for burial. Remember she came and she was wiping um, her, her hair. She poured this pure nard over Jesus' head and over his feet and she was wiping his hair with her um, feet with her hair. Yeah, let's get it right. He speak with her, yes, with her hair. I believe that one. <laughs> she anointed him. She anointed him. So in one sense, it wasn't necessary. But also it wasn't necessary because he was in the beat. He was in the beat. In the grave. He arose. You read in verse 2 how it's very early. Very early on the first day of the week. That's Sunday, isn't it? The first day of the week. Very early. On the first day of the week, just after sunrise. Why, why so early? Get it out of the way? No. It's fear again, isn't it? Element of fear. They want to go early before people are up and around and about and so forth. They, they don't want to be seen. Just in case anyone sees them and challenges them and uh, that causes problems and so forth. But then as they're going along, they, they realise in verse 3, they realise there's a big problem. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? And all of that. You see, and, and you see how real the gospel is, how lifelike it is, how this is not fiction. Because fiction would have things just so, as I've said before, it wouldn't be women doing these kinds of things. It wouldn't be women to be the first Mary, Mary Magdalene in verse 9, would be the first to see the risen Christ. When it, I was writing it, you were writing it. In those days, we do it in a different way. But this is a very human reaction. They are not even thinking about this until suddenly hang on there's that stone in a way we saw it being put there how could we do that how could we remove it? it's a very really human reaction in times of stress in times of loss you, you don't think straight do you you don't think clearly and then suddenly it dawns to you upon you oh no what are we going to do what are we going to do and even if you feel I'm sort of saying about the weakness and the fear of women in which I am. What about the men? Well, why can't some of the men? Why not Peter, James, and John? They're you know stalwarts, they can come and surely they can be the ones to roll the stone away. They're fishermen, they're strong men, where are they? 
very exciting. At least the women are, are going to the tomb. At least the women are observing these things. At least the women, by faith, are, oh, if only we could do more, if only we could stop this, or if only we could do this, that, you know. Whereas the men, they're just finding away. They're carrying away. You know what happens? John's account tells us that night they were in a room together, hiding and locked away. The room locked for fear of the Jews. There's the men. There's the bold Peter. I'll stand with you. I'm, I'm prepared to die. You know, he did the rest free. I won't. I'll be there. He denied him, didn't he? Now he's in hiding. So if you feel oh, I'm putting the women down and saying the women are full of fear, what about the men? Even more so. Even more so. But then you see in verse 4, they look up. They saw the stone. Though very large, have been rolled away. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Don't need to do that now, do we? Don't got to worry about that one. Problem solved. And and here's the thing, you know, if we talk about the women being full of fear, look, there's boldness here because there's no fear, there's no hesitation. So in verse five, they entered the tomb. I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if there's something, you know. <clears throat> Sort of, yeah, there's an element of fear attached with that, isn't it? But not for them. Not for them. They go straight in. Straight in. And when they go in, who do they meet? Who do they meet? They saw a young man. Don't think purely human. Don't think human. Dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. Dressed in a white robe. A young man dressed in a white robe. Whenever scripture speaks in such ways, it's a visitation of angels. This is an angel. This is an angel whom they see. And one of the proofs of that is their terror. Their absolute terror. It says in the NIV, they were alarmed. They were alarmed. And it's a word that's means to be deeply distressed, to be suddenly struck with awe of fear, fear and wonder. Exactly the same word that we read of Jesus in Gethsemane. Deeply distressed was Jesus. That was the time when he knelt. No, he started kneeling, but he fell on his face. He prayed. And his stress, that deep distress was so great that his anguish was, he sweat, and his sweat was like drops of blood. And that's when he cried out and said, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, yours be done. The beginning of his anguish, it came on him with a suddenness that was filled with terror, filled with fear. That's exactly the same word we have here. They were alarmed. It's the same word. They have a terror upon them. Is it usual to meet an angel? And we talk about people, we say when someone does a good deed, oh, you're an angel, thank you. We, we use it in that way, and that's nice to have that said of you, that you're an angel and so forth. But who here has really seen an angel? How many people today can say, oh, I've seen an angel. I, in fact, I saw a couple last week. There's a, let's bring my salesman back in again. I wasn't married at the time. I just imagine if I was married and I was trying to do this job as a salesman. And I came home and my wife says to me, did you meet anyone interesting today? Oh, yes, I, I met her so-and-so. I met Mr. Clark, the bank manager. I met the Bob Builder. But I also met, I also met an angel. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Do you want to come and see? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll just uh, put the kettle on for you. You wouldn't, that wouldn't be your action, would it? And here, their response is that they are seized with terror. Seized with terror. And every time in scripture, you read of an encounter with one sent from heaven. It's the one sent from heaven who has to speak and calm the fearful heart. Because every time a human being has an encounter with one sent from heaven, terror comes upon them. Not because it's unusual, but because God has set eternity into the heart of man and woman and child. 
every one of us. Eternity is set into our hearts. And when we meet someone from, sent from heaven, it brings that all to the surface. Though we may have suppressed comfortably the truth of God and his ways, though we may have got our life into a nice niche where we don't have to think too much about what happens when we die and so forth, when an angel suddenly appears, terror comes, all that swept away, and suddenly comes to the mind this sense of, I can't stand before God. Stand before the one who is ineffable right too great to be expressed in words and the realization that i can't do it i can't do it the angel see don't be alarmed says the angel don't be alarmed it's the angel who has to come and say to them don't be afraid it's the same word again it's that same word don't be deeply distressed that same word that Jesus experienced in Gethsemane, deep, sudden distress. Don't be, says the angel. Don't be. He says, he goes on, you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus who? Jesus, the Nazarene, an angel. Who is, excuse me, angel? Who do you think you're speaking of? This is the one who made you. How dare you? A mere angel speak of how our Lord as simply Jesus the Nazarene. Get that angel now immediately sent back before the Lord. He needs to be trained. He needs to refocus. He needs to get his truth right. Jesus the Nazarene. But can you see why he's doing it? Can you see why the angel does it? Who are you looking for? You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Who are you looking for? You're looking for a man. You're looking for the Nazarene. You're looking for Jesus, the mere man. That's who you're looking for. The one who was crucified. The one who was put into a tomb. The one who was dead. You're, you're looking for a body. You're looking for a dead man. You're looking for the wrong Jesus. You see? The address of the angel, Jesus, no angel would give the Lord of glory a title like that, except in this regard, that Mary and her friends are coming and they're looking for the wrong Jesus. A Jesus who is overcome, a Jesus who's beaten, a Jesus who's dead. And they themselves are preoccupied with death. They've come to anoint the body because in some way they hope that that might give them a kind of a closure on the mass. That they might be able to move on with their lives and overcoming their grief. But the angel was saying to them effectively, and he goes on to say it, doesn't he, as well. The angel effectively is saying to them, look, you've come looking for death. You've come looking for one who's died. I'm here to tell you he's alive. I'm here to tell you about life. That kingdom of God that Joseph was looking for. It's come. It's come. Because Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus is alive. And pause on that. How many of us, how many of us have sought or do still seek the wrong Jesus? Is that you? Is Jesus just a bit part of your life? Is salvation coming to Jesus, coming to life? Is the cross and all that took place there just a bit part? A bit confusing, really. Perhaps it was necessary. We don't really understand. And you have to kind of say a prayer that involves it in order to become a Christian, but I don't really understand what it's about. You found the wrong Jesus. Because the whole reason, the whole purpose, someone comes to Christ, truly comes to Christ, is that they see their need. They see what they are. They see their sin and they see that, and they understand that one day I've got to stand before God. Me, a sinner. Me, clothed in all the filth of my sin. How can I get this off? I can't get it off like someone who's got an unwanted tattoo. You can't get rid of it by washing it. You can't get rid of it by scrubbing it. It won't go. It's only the blood of Christ that can cleanse. It's only through coming to Jesus who was crucified that you can be forgiven of sin. But you're not going to come to a dead man. 
It's the understanding that he conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the devil. And he rose. New life. New life. It's the understanding of these things. That's the Jesus I want to find. That's the Jesus I'm looking for. That's the Jesus Joe, Jesus Joseph was looking for. That's the Jesus that the Marys and so forth haven't yet fully understood. Oh, but they will. They will. Have you? Do you? Have you come to such a Jesus? And then literally where he says, you are looking for Jesus. The word is seek. Seek, which is used elsewhere in scripture. Seek first. God's kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. When you seek passing things, they want to anoint his body and move on. An example of how we seek uh, really with great um, zeal and purpose we seek passing things and it's good to have the things of this world the lord has blessed us with them for sure but some people seek them as though that's all because for them at this point they're blind and it feels as though that is all don't seek the passing things they won't fail but seek eternal things is found in christ many are preoccupied with passing things what we need to be seeking, be sure we're seeking, is eternal things found in the risen Christ. In verse 7, he tells them, tell my disciples, and Peter, see that? And Peter, Peter's name, because Peter has fallen so low, Peter needs to be storing, and that's another story for another day, but tell my disciples, and Peter, that I'm going ahead of you, into Galilee, there you will see him, just as he told you. They have forsaken him, but he hasn't forsaken them. And it's not about their courage. It's not about their abilities because they don't display him. The women and Peter and the rest of the disciples, the women at the tomb, the disciples hiding away. God chose the foolish things of the world, the shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Why? Well, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Yes, it's the kingdom of God. Those who see their need, those who say, I can't do it. Really. I can't save myself. I can't even get through this life. I need a help to help me through this life. Never mind looking at what is to come. Never mind looking at facing you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The ones who throw themselves before the Lord and say, save me, Lord. Save me. The facts for the resurrection are very strong. But knowing facts won't save anyone. It's not an empty tomb that saves. It's faith in a risen Christ. That's what saves. An angel's testimony doesn't rid them of their fear. You read verse 8. They're still fearful. An angel's testimony, no, doesn't rid them of their fear. Boldness doesn't come to someone by facts. But faith. In a risen Christ. While the men are hiding, while the women are trembling, Joseph acts by faith. The centurion professes by faith. Would you this morning? If we all had to one by one get up and give a declaration of faith on you, what would you be doing? What would you be doing? Watching on doesn't produce disciples. It's for my wedding. Following. It's following Christ that produces a disciple. Why not? Signs, miracles, even angels, oh, don't produce faith. Then Only we can wedding. see more signs, more miracles well, today. Than well, they they Jesus was in front of them even performing such things. 
That doesn't produce pain. Well, what croaking is it? Pain comes from hearing the gospel. Prepare for a marriage that will never be. You can drink any wine. The risen Christ. Not that the pharaoh and Ramesses be betrayed. Each and every one of us. Why should you just say a care of which pharaoh? Must one day give an account for the only ones who will be saved. The only ones who will be saved, the only ones who will be saved are the ones who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sin now in this life. And Moses has risen from the dead. Such a one is a savior. Such a one has a home on high. Such a one can know by faith, courage, boldness, acts, and so forth. Doesn't mean to say you won't get it wrong. But a God given strength and a God given ability to begin to live a new life, a new life with Christ at the heart. Do you have that? Do you want that? You don't have it. Come to Christ. Ask for it. Lord, Lord, give me that life. I want to know a strength that I haven't got at this time. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Faith comes from hearing the gospel. It's conclusion. Christ is risen. Faith comes, salvation comes from a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing him, spiritually speaking, as a risen Christ. You see that. You see Christ as a risen. And so we want to conclude by saying, well, we, we leave them, those women, full of joy, full of excitement. But no, we don't, not yet. Look, look at verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They still have this fear. Ah, oh, but that joy and that peace and that excitement, it came, it came, look at verse 9 there. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene saw the risen Christ and that was transforming. Wonder upon wonder. Does it come to you? Has a sight of Christ risen come to you? I don't mean that you see a, a vision in, in, in a pictorial, pictorial way. What I mean is the understanding in your mind and a heart to believe these things, a heart that would make you as it well might want to reach out your arms and say, Lord, I want to grasp hold of you. You see, they saw by sight. We see by faith. We see by faith. And faith overcomes fear. So don't remain if you are. Don't remain distant. Don't remain an observer. Especially an observer of Christians. Because when you look at Christians, you'll see their failings. You'll see the things they get wrong. We're not yet a finished article. But I tell you what, if you know anything of me and you can see my failings, fair enough, I agree. But I tell you what, if you look at what I was before I became a Christian, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near me. You really wouldn't, even if you don't want to go anywhere near me now. You wouldn't want to go near me in days before for different reasons. But what transformation has come upon me? It's all his good. It's not getting married. It's not having children. It's not having responsibilities. It's done that. The Lord has blessed me with those things. But it's the Lord. It's the power of the gospel. I could name a name here this morning. I could bring him up here. Who could testify to the Lord working in his life in such a way, a transformative way, similar to my own? But we can do something. We could put him on the spot. But this is real. Life is real in Christ. But don't look at us for perfection. We're not what we should be yet. It doesn't give us an excuse. But where to look is Christ. Look to Christ. Look to him. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And if you're a Christian here this morning, 
You need to get that word right, that word watched rightly. Not observing from afar, but jumping in the deep end, as it were. Faith. By faith. Watching, looking, searching, seeking, living out his kingdom. Faith makes a difference. And faith makes a difference that the world sees and the world needs to see more and more in us. This is a new life. It's a resurrection life. And that is seen. Is it seen in you? Is it seen in you? It must be. It must be. Because faith in action overcomes fear. Indeed, we might say, put it correctly, faith, we act despite our fears. May we all grow over this Easter time as we meditate on these things. May we all, if we haven't come to faith, may we come to faith. If we have come to faith, may we be those who grow in faith and act as those who are stirred by what Christ has done in our hearts, despite our fears, to do it anyway. What was said at the beginning, courage is not having no fear. It's acting despite your fears. Faith doesn't come all wooey over you so you can do something dangerous. Faith is doing something dangerous when you feel fear. Hey, you can experience the peace and the blessings of the Lord. And that, my friends, is truly wonderful. But the most wonderful thing of all is that your name is written in heaven. It's yours. Amen. Amen.